CBS News Miami. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Pastrana and welcome to CBS News Miami's 4 p.m. Quickcast. Let's take a look at today's top stories. Right off the top at four, a police involved shooting in Southwest Miami Dade Chopper 4 over the scene where you can see several police cars in the area. This happened along Grossman Farm Road and Southwest 182nd Avenue. There appears to be one person dead there on the scene. We do have a crew working this story, gathering details on the ground. We'll have the latest details tonight at five. Always alerting, always tracking. This is next weather. Taking a live look outside right now. Cool and comfortable, but how long is that all going to last? Next weather, Chief Meteorologist and Hurricane Specialist Ivan Cabrera joins us now with a look ahead at the forecast. It is nice, Ivan. It is fantastic. And if you woke up early enough, we had a morning low of 59. We haven't done that since back in March. That's something, right? So finally, under 60 degrees. Our typical overnight temperature is in the mid 60s, which is about where we're going to be starting to getting it through tonight. So the coolest air is done. We're going to go to wind that's going to be coming off the water, and that's going to uh, sh shut off our uh, cool air here, certainly uh, for the next uh, few days. Look at the temperatures though this morning, 58 there in Fort Lauderdale, 59 in Miami and Homestead, and uh, we even managed uh, temperatures in the mid 60s there in Marathon Key West at 67. The rebound uh, is underway despite the fact that we have some high and mid-level clouds that are streaming in from the uh, Gulf, and that's giving the milky sky appearance uh, for the afternoon, but um, we've got plenty of sunshine as well peeking through, and that allowed temperatures to warm up. We're going to even warm up even more so as we head into uh, tomorrow. Overnight temperatures, we still have dry air at the surface, and what that will do is it will allow temperatures to cool off pretty quickly here. Uh, quickly here. So we're looking at low 70s and then upper 60s by the time we get into tonight and 10 o'clock with uh, mostly clear skies. So drier and warmer, that's going to be the headline for both Thursday and a Friday. In fact, Friday, we're already going to start getting above average. Tomorrow will be right where we should be for this time of year, which is about 80 degrees. But you see the winds coming off the water there, and that's going to keep us with shower chances are very minimal, but they're going to be there not just through the end of the week, but also heading into the weekend. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. We're going to be ahead of a front that eventually will make it through here as we head into the early part of next week. And once that happens, we're going to have some showers that will continue but some cooler temperatures as well, although this one does not look as potent as the last one with dry air and really chilly temperatures, but at least it'll bring us down from where I think we will be this weekend, which is mid 80s. So we're getting above average uh, all over again. That front will just bring us down uh, to a couple of degrees below average for the season here. As we check it on rain tracker, there's just not much doing, just a lot of cloud cover around and in the tropics. Of course, the hurricane season ends tomorrow. No development. We are done uh, with uh, 2023. These were the names made it all the way down to Tammy. And don't forget our special coming up tomorrow with myself and the next weather team will be wrapping up the 2023 season. Take a look ahead at uh, what we can at 2024. That's coming up tomorrow at 8 o'clock on our streaming platforms there. Checking in on the forecast in for tomorrow, upper 70s for high temperatures to near 80 degrees. And then look at this, mid 80s, mid 80s. Uh, we could even see some spots across interior areas in the upper 80s away from the breeze. And then a little cool down there by the end of the period. All right, Ivan, thank you. Dozens of assisted living facility residents now in limbo after police show up with a search warrant claiming their home is breaking the law. CBS News Miami's Peter Dench explains. Miami-Dade police say they executed a warrant at this home in southwest Miami-Dade that they say was an unlicensed ALF. Dozens of officers and investigators were at this ALF at Southwest 207th Street and 122nd Avenue from agencies including the Department of Health and DCF and the Miami-Dade Police Department's Medical Crimes Unit. We spoke with Miami-Dade Police Detective Alvaro Zabaleta. The Miami-Dade Police Department Medical Crimes Unit, in collaboration with multiple go. federal partners and local partners yes, right now, with right us now. today to include DCF, Healthcare Administration, Florida Department of Health, we've all come together in order to, uh, to assist in an investigation of a resident that's right behind us on 207th Street and 122nd Avenue Southwest, which basically it's an adult living facility that is being run without a license. Of course, um, that can lend themselves to Disaster. Why? Because of the fact that these individuals that are in here that are employees are not medically trained. They don't have the proper certifications necessary. We have, we were talking to one of the residents in there that there were, right now there's 15 people inside, but they says that it's right about now the capacity is at approximately 30. 
So you're looking at 30 individuals that are living inside a home where, of course, it's not certified by the state. It doesn't have a license to be an adult living facility. It's not meeting the proper pro protocols and procedures and guidelines that are, for, that are brought forth by the state of Florida and, of course, Miami-Dade County ordinances. Detective Zabaleta said that this investigation was launched several months ago. At this point, it is not known if there will be any arrests. Coming up at 5, we will hear from a resident who has been living at this home for more than 15 years. In southwest Miami-Dade, Peter Dench, CBS News, Miami. We have new details involving the transgender athlete controversy at Monarch High School. The Florida Department of Education sent us a statement. It says, quote, under Governor DeSantis, boys will never be allowed to play girls sports. It's that simple. As soon as the department was notified that a biological male was playing on a girls team in Broward County, we instructed the district to take immediate action since this is a direct violation of Florida law. It went on to say it is completely unacceptable for the male student to have been allowed to play on a girls team and we expect there will be serious consequences for those responsible. On Tuesday, dozens of students walked out of Monarch High School. They're showing support for a transgender girl and the school staff who were reassigned in the fallout over her participation on the girls volleyball team. Florida law bans students who are born male from competing in female sports. Five employees have been reassigned pending the investigation, including Principal James Cecil. A final day of tributes and farewells to Rosalind Carter. The former first lady had a private funeral in the small Georgia town where she was born and where she lived for decades with her husband, former President Jimmy Carter. CBS News Miami Skylar Henry is live in Plains, Georgia with more on how she was honored today. Skylar. Hey, Lauren, good to be with you. Well, one thing is abundantly clear. Plains loves the Carters and the Carters loves Plains back. And how fitting of an opportunity for the people here to say goodbye to their former first lady. Family and friends arrived at the Carters small hometown church for a final outpouring of love for the former first lady. Give us this day. The private funeral was held at Maranatha Baptist Church, where Rosalind and Jimmy Carter were cherished members of the congregation. They'd been married for 77 years when Mrs. Carter died last week at the age of 96. A tearful pastor, Tony Loudon, called her the greatest first lady. Our first lady excelled them all. The 99-year-old former president also attended, as did the couple's extended family who remembered the Carter's extraordinary marriage. Dad got used to mom disagreeing with him <laughs> because she was really good at it. Uh, and she became a partner in the true sense of the word, where they had equal footing. The Carters left their mark on Plains, Georgia, with a population of nearly 600 people. Rosalind's death is deeply felt. What did it mean for you to be here today? Uh, it means a lot to be asked to come out here today. I just want to show respect for the Carter family. As First Lady from 1977 to 1981, she was her husband's closest advisor and then became a political force herself, traveling the world to help fight disease and famine. But this small town was home base. The Carter family trailed her casket to her final resting place on the grounds of the first couple's home where her husband still lives. A trailblazer, a woman who broke barriers, so many ways that people are remembering the former first lady. One interesting note before I give it back to you, Lauren, one of the Carter family traditions all through their uh, life in public office was wearing lays, and that was during the time where the former president was in the Navy. That was something that the former first lady loved with all of her heart, and so you saw not only the former president wearing a lay, but many relatives of hers as well. Mm, a very special woman who leaves behind a very powerful legacy. Skylar Henry, live for us in Georgia this evening. Thank you. Three Cuban migrants are now in custody with U.S. Border Patrol after coming ashore near Key West earlier this morning. Officials sent us this picture of the homemade vessel used by the three Cuban migrants. Border Patrol agents have processed them and they are expected to be sent back. We'll have more news when we return.
Welcome back to CBS News Miami's 4 p.m. Quickcast. Now to the latest in the Israel Hamas war. CBS News Miami has learned a U.S. citizen is expected to be among the hostages Hamas released today. Israel is also releasing an additional 30 Palestinian prisoners. The extended ceasefire is set to expire after this most recent exchange, although intense negotiations are underway to continue the truce even longer, which would enable more humanitarian aid to flow into Gaza. CBS News Miami's Natalie Brand reports from Capitol Hill. Hamas released more hostages Wednesday on the sixth day of a temporary ceasefire. The fate of Israel's youngest hostage, a 10-month-old baby and his four-year-old brother and mother remains uncertain. The Israeli military said Wednesday that it's examining the reliability of a Hamas claim that Shiri Bibas and her sons had been killed in Israeli airstrikes. CBS News could not independently verify that claim. Israeli official Benny Gantz said he spoke with the Bibas family today. He called the report painful. Relatives of hostages met with lawmakers on Capitol Hill calling for the release of all hostages. Israel believes around 150 remain in captivity. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said he will push for the temporary ceasefire to be extended during his trip this week to Israel. It's also enabled us to, uh, to surge humanitarian assistance into the people of Gaza who so desperately need it. In Gaza, residents lined up for supplies at a U.N. distribution center. Health officials warn of dire outcomes facing the millions of Palestinian civilians living in the war-ravaged territory. Eventually, we will see more people dying from disease than we are even seeing from the bombardment if we are not able to put back this health system. The White House says more than 2,000 trucks of aid have made it into Gaza since October 21st, but UN health officials say the surge in aid is still not nearly as much as needed. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Miami taxpayers will not be on the hook for the multi-million dollar judgment against Commissioner Joe Carollo. CBS News Miami's Jacqueline Quinn is outside Miami City Hall with what a new federal court order is revealing. It was the $63.5 million question. How is Joe Carollo supposed to pay for this judgment against him? Through these federal documents, we now know. According to the federal documents, the city of Miami is being directed to garnish Carollo's wages, no more than 25% of his earnings. This is supposed to happen during each pay period. He's being ordered to pay because of a lawsuit brought against him by the owners of Miami Ball and Chain. They allege that Corio harassed them for supporting a political opponent. Back in June, a jury agreed. And now we have the federal order making him start paying a portion of that massive judgment. Now, according to public records obtained by our partners at the Miami Herald, the commissioner's salary here is only $58,000 a year. In Coconut Grove, I'm Jacqueline Quinn, CBS News, Miami. And we'll be speaking with Commissioner Joe Carroyo later tonight. Look for that on CBS News Miami starting at 5. That's CBS News Miami's Quick Cast. I'm Lauren Pastrana. Stay tuned for more news right here on CBS Miami.